Last year, Fortune named our first guest as one of the top business leaders changing healthcare, a true corporate innovator, and one of the most forceful advocates calling for change in corporate culture, focusing not just on the bottom line, but also on the wellness of employees. The fact that he's also the CEO of one of the country's largest health insurers makes that message all the more compelling. And to talk about how the recent CBS Aetna merger, uh, which I mentioned before, affects the overall US healthcare system and what the future of that healthcare system is, please welcome the chairman and CEO of Aetna, Mark Bertolini. Good to see you. Good to see you. So you have a front row seat to one of the biggest changes that are happening in, in healthcare today. Mm -hmm. uh, how did this happen? You know, I know you had conversations with Larry Merlo, but before that you, you said, hmm, what were you looking at that, that needed to change? Well, if you take a look at um, how people think about their health today, when you talk to them about what matters, they never describe themselves as a disease. Mm -hmm. I'm a spinal cord injury survivor. I never describe myself that way. But I have limitations that affect how the life I want to lead by virtue of my spinal cord injury. So if you could start a conversation with people that said, what is your problem? And said, you know, what is it about your health that gets in the way of the life you want to lead? And then from that, develop a set of alternatives for them to pursue. And then look at the barriers for each of those alternatives you have an opportunity to engage the individual. Because unless you're talking about their alternatives and their barriers, you're really not going to have a chance to engage them. And that's the problem with population health, which we were talking about five years ago, is everybody's part of an average population. Let's all make them look the same. Here's the ideal health status instead of personalizing the health to each individual. And so where do we do that? Because you, as you once told me, you spend about an average, the average person spends about 20 hours a year right. in the healthcare system. You know, that's in the doctor's office, in the clinic, in the hospital, that's an average. Um, and out of that, if you figured you sleep seven and a half hours a day, yep. um, seven and a half hours a night, I hope, rather. Yep. Um, and so if you figure that's about 6,200 hours of waking time, 20 out of 6,200 is 99.67% you spend outside of the healthcare system. Right. And yet that is where the, that's, that's where we put all the burden on that time. Two very interesting issues. Number one, we've had the second year in a row of life expectancy decrease in the United States. Um, we have an opioid epidemic where we consume 80% of all the opioids produced in the world as an American public. Um, and we now have um, um, a population that has 60% of their life expectancy determined by the zip code that they live in versus their genetic code, right. and only 10% by the clinical care they receive. Yeah, it's incredible. So you've got this huge vacuum, and on the other side of it, we now have price arbitrage in the system. HCCI just released some data that showed for the last decade, health care utilization has gone down in every single category except for drugs, which are up 1.3% uh, uh, on an annual basis. And yet, price overall costs are up 30 some percent. What is it? It's price. So the price arbitrage now with the healthcare system makes it worth to make the investments in the community. So nobody has to use the healthcare system, so which is counterintuitive to benefits as an insurance company. So we're using one percent less healthcare in general, but it's costing us 30 percent more. And right. That's what, and that's price. <laughs> yeah. So now the story of how you started to study these social determinants of care. Obviously, you had your own experiences, but you had a you had a, a, you were giving grand rounds with, with Sir, Sir Michael. Columbia University with Sir Michael Marmot, so that was kind of intimidating. And so I needed to know something about it, and the research that I did to find out about it said, wait a minute, it was like, you know, I'm an Italian, why do Italians have flat foreheads? It's like, oh my God, why haven't we thought of this? Um, <laughs> and why haven't we focused on this? So we started doing work in the communities, and we've now launched a thing called the Healthy Cities and Counties Challenge in 50 cities across the United States and counties, focused on this issue of what can we do around built environment, services, programs, food, urban farms. We've started 3,300 urban farms, urban farm beds across America in the last five years as a way of solving the community problem, the social determinant, versus waiting for people to show up with their warranty card 
Yeah. You got health care, which so is the insurance. Health your insurance business is, is walking around giving people warranty cards. We sell warranties, right? It's a, we you, sell warranties. When you get broken, you show up. Holders. Do your shareholders know you talk like this about your company? Yeah, they do. Okay, all right, all right. Hasn't hurt our stock price no, yet. Has not hurt your stock price. Yeah. So, uh, but so your mission though is to move the engagement to the other sixty. 200 hours that we spend somehow to move that out. And so how does CVS, how does this partnership with CVS, this merger happen? Well, I would, I, you know, I would stop, don't think about the store, think about the connection between the provider community and home. And if we can, through price arbitrage, do more in the home and more in the local community, we need to have a demand model that understands it. Mm -hmm. And then we need to build a supply chain, some of which could come from a CVS store. But what you're in essence building is a marketplace in the community around health. It looks like Amazon, just purely for health. And you could charge, you could pay for rides from Lyft, you could bring food to people's homes, you could um, do um, light construction on homes like ramps for a lot cheaper than just one ER visit a year. What? Right, so why not, why not spend that money? Why not eliminate benefits as an ocean in health insurance, which is to prevent people from running wild in the, in the world with their warranty card, right. and just say, you know what, we're gonna do what we can in the community to help you by understanding demand in the community, demand in the home, we've got all the devices to do that, we're gonna build a supply chain, mm -hmm. and that supply chain is gonna provide services to you at a better cost, and when you need it, and it's about you. Then you look at the provider community, which sends people into the world 99.6% of the time, all assuming that we're gonna do exactly what they told us. But what we know is that when we spend that 15 minutes with a doctor every year, we lie about 75% of the time about our diet and our exercise. Oh yeah, doc, all over that. <laughs> My doctor one time said to me, well then why are you 20 pounds heavier? And he pulled out the wine glass. He said, you tell me you have two, wines a glass, two glasses of wine every night. Draw a line on the glass for me. <laughs> and when I did, he said, you're drinking five. Stop it. And so it's this notion of what is it that we can do to help the provider community. So instead of taking patients away, what if we were their open source PCMH, patient-centered medical home, in the community where we said to them, when, you're, when you want a patient to get the follow-up, just send them to us. We'll figure out the rest for them. We'll just do it for them. Now, but there is a, a social compact that has to happen. I mean, the, the patient has to agree to right. a different set of rules than, than we've seen in the past. I mean, more data access, you know, basically, as you, as you say, you know, you want to create a new relationship that says, hey, surrender all this stuff to us and we'll, and we'll create a plan together. Now, the only way you get permission to get the data is to use it in a way that matters to them. Mm -hmm. So you got to reverse the logic. And you have to say to individuals, tell me what your problem is. Right. You've got pedal neuropathy as a diabetic. If we get your diabetes under control and we say, hey, you know, you can run the 5K at the senior center next year, and you've never run an inch in your life, right. unengaged. But if you say to them, you know, I, what is it about your feet that bother you? So you have to have a natural language processing capability to say to people, what is it about your feet that bother you? Well, I can't walk to the, the senior center anymore to play cards twice a week. Or I used to take my grandchildren for a walk in the park. Right. That's where you engage them. You say, well, you know, if we get your diabetes under control, your feet will work again and you can do that again. Are you in? But we need this data to do that. Will you let us have access to that data so we can help you? Completely different conversation than saying, dump all your data to me. We're going to put the wizards on it and we're going to spit out information for you that's going to cause you to change your behavior. And you talk a lot about this thing called the next best action. What, right. what do you mean by that? So for each individual, it's now possible for us to look at their current status, mm -hmm. look at their socioeconomic factors, their zip code, the devices they use, and say to them, if you do this thing next, mm -hmm. it's going to move you along the path of what you want to accomplish with your health. So the team has been talking to me for about this for about a year, and I said to them, okay, well, show me. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we have these, these what we call member journeys or ideas of how people could use it. 44-year-old, type 1 diabetic, 7.3 hemoglobin A1C, under 7 is good. We can give them one or two next best actions. You need to get your hemoglobin A1C checked more often because you're a data geek. And if you do 10,000 steps a day versus 8,000 steps a day, we can get you to 6.9. You're in the green, you're good. 
And when you accomplish that, give them the next best action. And so you're feeding them information that says, here's what you can do next to be better. It's about me, it's about my case, it's my data. You know, so I just want to give some background on you. Since you became CEO, just so you know, because this is Fortune Magazine, and I need to talk about your stock, uh, your, the total return on your stock is beating the market by three times. Right. I mean, since you become CEO. It's during a relatively robust period for the stock market. You don't talk like a CEO. You, know, mm -hmm. you're, you, you say things that I would imagine would scare the Jesus out of your shareholders. And part of what you've been saying, at least in various conversations, is that the current model cannot survive. And so, so you, this is what sort of threw you into this very right. aggressive merger. Well, the, 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 cap, the capitalist model of today says that we should manage to an earnings number that then makes the street believe that we have a going concern that they can get a return on. Mm -hmm. That's not the model. The model is about business fundamentals. What are we doing to invest in our business fundamentals mm -hmm. so that we have a consistently good product or valuable product that the market will continue to buy? And when you have that, then the earnings come out of the machine. You don't manage the earnings. They come out of the bottom of the machine. And if you run your business that way, the earnings will come. I've never once worried about where the earnings were coming from. I've worried about the business fundamentals. And in our business, it's people. And investing in our people was the most important thing we can do. So I think every business, whether you're for profit or not for profit, well run not for profits, still make a margin. And as the sisters of uh, the Daughters of Charity, now the Ascension Health System once said, no margin, no mission. And so a well-run not-for-profit does as well as a well-run for-profit. The only difference is the for-profit pays taxes. So I want to get a question in here. While you're thinking, about it, please raise your hand, and we have mic runners will come, and it'll make it easy. What is the next move for, let's say this merger goes through, and maybe you don't want to talk about it until anything happens. <laughs> but I don't suppose you're done yet. There's more integration that goes, that, that sort of chases this model that you're, you're, you're talking about. Well, you know, all these ideas are great ideas. Mm -hmm. um, they're absolutely worthless without execution. So you have to, you know, it's, it's the basic, you, know, you have basic science, then you have applied science, and you have commercialization. And the step from applied science to commercialization is always the hardest. Right. And it's the ugliest work. Yeah. Because it's easy to talk about it. It's really hard to actually make it work. So when you get into the world with, you know, data and insights and all these things for people, you have to engage them where it matters to them. That's a humanistic approach to using data and understanding how they can be engaged and buy into what it is you're trying to do with them. It makes them sticky. Yeah, we've got a question over there. Yeah, hi. I'm can you identify yourself too? So yes, we, yeah. I'm Craig LaFay from RTI International. We're a nonprofit research organization. I really appreciate the comments you're making about the patient-centered, but particularly this question of trying to figure out what's the problem the person has that the data can help them solve. And I've been on that track for a while myself, and I find that with a lot of experts, I do a lot of work in public health where I think you can start personalizing things a bit if you start thinking about marketing and not just universal application of principles to different issues. Uh, how do you try and bring people around to the idea that maybe it's not the data that drives behavior change, maybe it's understanding the people and their problems first? Okay. So great question. It's the biggest struggle any CEO or high level operating executive experiences. It's this idea that you know, you've got a great idea. Boy, this sounds really cool. Show me. And then you have to go, you have to have the patience I always like to say CEOs need to be um, um, unrealistically expectant but patiently tolerant of progress. And so you have to push the team, but you have to keep saying, show me, show me, show me. And your role as a leader is to provide the next insight to say, have you thought about this? So we're rolling out next best actions this March. And it's going to be a big deal when we, if we get it right. And it's going to be part of our partnership with a lot of other people that we're doing business with. And so this next best action, I said to them, so what are people going to just sort of, is it going to ring in their ear? Is it going to fall from heaven like the voice of God? I mean, what's going to happen? Well, we had to create pods of teams with thousands of patients in each pod to work with them to understand what it is it, 
about the preferences they have for receiving that information, what kind of help do they need to eliminate barriers to be able to pursue that. I often remind people that people buy Peloton bikes and the people that buy Peloton bikes, the vast majority, don't look like anything like the people in the Peloton commercials. <laughs> But the barrier is they want to get fit, so they don't want to go to the gym, so they want a Peloton bike. <laughs> Brilliant. That's an insight. So how do you bring that to market? And so you have to have this constant set of meetings, and you have to sit and listen, and you have to let people share, and then you have to give them insights, and then they have to go out and try it, and they have to come back. And most CEOs, most leaders don't have the patience for that. They just assume they go away and start it, and let me know how it goes a few months later. That's the dirty work of leadership and actually creating innovation. Innovation is in that journey, those meetings and those insights, not in the big idea. And if you look at any great innovation we've had in society, you know, there were people who, the, the idea isn't the same anymore than what it originally started. Mm -hmm. When Steve Jobs looked inside the first Mac and said those transistors need to be lined up, and Johnny Ive said, well, don't worry about it. Nobody's gonna see it. He goes, I'll know they're there. It created a notion about the aesthetic. The aesthetic was most important. That's the user interface. That's why everybody likes to hold these devices, because it's beautiful. And so that's, that's the patience that you need to go through in looking inside the machine and saying, line these up. And I don't think people have the patience for that. Mm. That's good. We have a question all the way over there on the left. Hi there, uh, CEO of Allergy Amulet, Abigail Barnes, also the author of An Entrepreneur's Guide to Certified B Corporations and Benefit Corporations. Uh, you once said that under the current model of capitalism, uh, you know, it, it will destroy capitalism ultimately. You've substantially raised, raised the minimum wage for your employees. You've created healthcare programs to offset um, healthcare costs for, for uh, your employees. And so my question is, are you seeing a shift towards a more stakeholder-based approach to business rather than one that is focused on shareholder primacy. Larry Fink, you know, CEO of BlackRock, also made this point recently in his investor newsletter, largest uh, investment for firm in the world. So I just want your thoughts on, is this a trend? Are we seeing more of this? And Larry and his folks are our largest investor. So they put their money where their mouth is. Um, and I think, I think there's more and more CEOs coming into the role who, want, who now have the courage to say we have a broader responsibility, not only to our shareholders, but to our employees and to our communities. Mm -hmm. And I have this notion that you know, our, our ecosystems, our social and economic ecosystems have gotten too big for our governments to manage. Mm -hmm. And so we try to get bigger government to manage bigger ecosystems and it doesn't work. And so everything's going back to community. And, and, and what's happening is 288 cities, counties, and companies stood up and said, we're gonna support the Paris Accords even if our nation doesn't. That's community. And so I think the best way to manage the kind of shift we're in is to go back to community and to build smaller and smaller governance models to help support the growth of this. Because if we don't change, I'm certain that it will be changed for us. And wouldn't it be nice if the captains of of capitalism, men and women decided we're gonna change this now and we're gonna make it better. You know, you mentioned before a user interface and when most people think of the user interface in the healthcare system, they think about the triage desk at the hospital mm -hmm. or they think about what it's like with the billing department at their clinic or their hospital. I mean, they, they don't really get a good experience from their user interface. I, I can imagine if Johnny Ive is thinking about this, he must be, you know, frustrated about the design aspects of yep. this. How do we redesign the user interface for healthcare? You gotta get closer to the community, you gotta be in the community, and that's one of the reasons we put the companies together with CVS, right. is this idea that you know there are 10,000 stores within five miles of 80% of the American public. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be neat if you could just go to your local store? I mean, I, you know, I've even joked around and said, you know, we should put the soda stand back in there and you know, people sit at the counter and get a BLT or right. whatever it is you want, peanut butter and jelly sandwich is my favorite. And, you know, and just sort of hang out in this local community and get information you need from each other. Right. Doesn't necessarily need to be a practitioner um, from you know, um, your pharmacist, those sorts of things. And so that, that whole milieu could change and people could feel better about having the conversation we need to have. And maybe, just maybe, if we define health as healthy people are productive, productive people are spiritually, economically, and socially viable, and viable people are happy, yep. maybe we'd have better communities and better civility. Nice. 
All right, we have two quick questions. Can we keep them quick here? One over here first, and then we'll go. Yeah. Hi, I'm Yoki Matsuoka, CTO at Nest, and now a part of Google. Um, you know, you mentioned about um, bringing a lot of things distributed into homes, and you know, tech companies can help a lot on that. Um, from but. A lot of tech companies have ran too fast and then fallen down doing it really terribly in the past, as well as a lot of companies are scared to do it right and are not doing a lot. From your point of view, can you tell us the role that tech company, large tech companies should be playing right now? The tech companies should help us understand what information we can get from that piece of technology that, that will matter to the member. And what happens often with the tech companies, and we've you know, touched a lot of them over the last decade at, at Aetna, is that those tech companies want to sell us something. And it's not about selling something, it's about the customer experience front to back. What is it about that journey that we can assist with with the technology, and then let's figure out later how to pay all the people that are part of it. But immediately it comes up, I need so much per member per month in order for you to use my technology. Why? Um, all those sorts of, so I think it's, if you, if you if, and we're going through this work now, is defining the customer experience front to back, from the home to the healthcare system and back. If you define that, what types of technology would be incredibly useful as part of a platform to support that journey versus having it be something people have to buy? Because if we get, for every 50 basis points we change trend, we get $980 million of underwriting margin. So we'll pay for it. Mm. Just show us why it matters. Quick, very quick question right over here. I think we have, uh, we have one. Um, so, oh, go ahead, very quick, yeah. Yeah, hopefully quick question. Um, I love everything you've been talking about and the concept of the next best thing um, with, with uh, patients and individuals that are working to change behaviors and wonder how you think that plays into the mental health and wellness world because I easily see where data and AI helps with precision medicine and genomics and behavior but but how about um, on things above the neck? Um, it's all about everything above the neck. It's all up here, mm -hmm. right? The scariest place sometimes to be is between your own two ears alone. Um, or to let anybody else in, and that affects a lot of our behavior and the way we respond to things. So you can't separate mental health from physical health. It's all the same body. It's all the same thing. And, and so work, I think our opioid epidemic is a direct result of the loss of hope on a large swath of the American public who believe they have no future. Mm -hmm. And so they've just checked out. And, and that's a mental health problem. Yeah. It's not a physical problem. Mark, thank you. This has been great. I, we have 30 seconds left. What is the next big merger that's going to happen? Two sec 30 seconds. <laughs> any company. I have, you mean any company? Any company, any company. I have no idea. Right. I, yeah, I, that's, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get, I, yeah, we're still in front of the DOJ. I'm trying to get one deal right, done. Okay. <laughs> Mark, Mark Bertolini, thank you so much. That was Very good to see you, Claire. I love that. That was Thanks. so good. Thank you.